Great. Thank you so much. My name is Corby Sony, and I'm with the Lewin Group. Happy National Women's Health Week, and welcome to the webinar, Supporting the Preventive Healthcare Needs of Duly Eligible Women with Disabilities. Today's session will include a presenter-led discussion, followed by time for audience questions and answers. This session will be recorded. The recording and a copy of today's slide will be available at resourcesforintegratedcare.com. There are two ways to listen to today's presentation. Audio should automatically stream through your computer speakers. Make sure that your computer is connected to reliable internet and that the speakers are turned up. If the computer audio option is not working for you, there is also a dial-in option. To access this option at any time, click on the black phone widget at the bottom of the screen. A phone number and access code will appear. Calling the number will allow you to listen to the presentation through your phone. Continuing education credits and contact hours are available at no additional cost to participants. We strongly encourage you to check with your specific regulatory boards or other agencies to confirm that courses taken from these accrediting bodies will be accepted by that entity. You'll see on this slide that we've laid out the various continuing education credit and contact hour requirements. Social workers can obtain one continuing education credit through NASW if you complete the pretest at the beginning of the webinar and also complete the post-test. Nurses can obtain one continuing education contact hour through the California Board of Registered Nursing by completing the pretest and the post-test. For those interested in continuing education, you must complete, complete the pretest at the beginning of the webinar, as well as complete the post-test with a passing score by 11.59 p.m. Eastern tomorrow. This webinar is supported through the Medicare and Medicaid Coordination Office at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. MMCO is helping beneficiaries duly eligible for Medicare and Medicaid have access to seamless, high-quality health care that includes the full range of covered services in both programs. To learn more about current efforts and resources, please visit our website or follow us on Twitter for more details. Our Twitter handle is at integrate underscore care. You can also find us on LinkedIn. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce our presenters for today. First, we have Dr. Monica Mithra, who is the director of the Lurie Institute for Disability Policy and the Nancy Lurie Marks Associate Professor of Disability Policy at the Heller School for Social Policy Management at Brandeis University. Then, we have Dr. John Harris, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Sciences at the University of Pittsburgh, as well as the director of UPMC McGee Women's Hospital Center for Women with Disabilities. After Dr. Harris, we'll hear from Amy Shannon, who is a consumer at the UPMC McGee Women's Hospital Center for Women with Disabilities. And finally, we will hear from Sarah Triano, who is the Senior Director of Policy and Innovation of Complex Care at Centene Corporation. Here we have our learning objectives. As a result of attending this webinar, you will be able to recognize the challenges and barriers to accessing healthcare that women with disabilities face including attitudinal biases, physical access barriers, communication challenges, stigma, and unmet social needs. Identify how providers, care teams, and non-clinical staff can employ integrated and person-centered approaches to support women with disability in receiving care that meets their needs and preferences. And describe how health plans and providers can support women with disability by improving communication and physical accessibility. And here, we have the outline for today's event. We will first ask you to complete two introductory polls, and then Dr. Mithra will share an overview of the issue. She will be followed by Dr. Harris, who will share clinical considerations for accessible and inclusive healthcare for women with disabilities. And then our consumer speaker will discuss her experiences as a woman with disability accessing preventive healthcare. We will then hear from Sarah Triano, who will share a health plan's perspective and finally, we will end with an opportunity for you all to ask questions and hear responses from our presenters. To begin, let's use some polls to get an understanding of who is attending the webinar today. First, we'd like to know, which of the following best describes your professional area? Please choose one of the options provided on your screen. Mm 
you could move to the results. So it seems like most of our audience is um, health plan case managers, care coordinators. We also have health plan administration management, as well as um, providers in the audience. Welcome. And then our next question, uh, poll question. Um, the next question is, in what setting do you work? Please choose one of the options provided. And if we can move on to the results. The majority of our audience works in a health plan, but we also have some community-based organizations um, and some consumer organizations and long-term care facilities. Great. Well, thank you everyone for sharing in the polls. And with that, I will turn it to our first speaker, Dr. Mitra. Hi, Purvi. Thanks for the introduction. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, as Purvi mentioned, I'm Monica Mitra, and I'm the director of the Lurie Institute for Disability Policy at Brandeis University. Next slide, please. I'm um, going to be, in the next 10 minutes or so, providing uh, you with an overview of what we know about people who are duly eligible, and really focusing on women who are duly eligible. And right off the bat, I'm going to tell you that uh, in terms of research, in terms of data, specifically when it comes to dually eligible women, um, the research is pretty slim. Um, so what I'm going to end up doing is just talking about sort of what we know from the data and also filling in the gaps um, by, um, uh, by discussing and by documenting what we know about women with disabilities in general. So first, I'm going to give you an understanding of the population, like who are people who are duly eligible. Um, then I'm going to go into specifics about um, uh, chronic conditions for women who are duly eligible, uh, preventive care, preventive health care access, preconception care, as well as perinatal care. And for each of them, I'm going to discuss some of the barriers that women who are duly eligible face um, in accessing these types of care. And at the end, I'm going to um, summarize and give you uh, an idea of, of next steps um, and really what are the data gaps. So what we do know is that as of 2018, 12.2 million people um, were enrolled in Medicare and Medicaid. And 60% of um, dually eligible women, are, uh, dually eligible individuals are women, and this is based on the available data that we have. What we also know is that people who are duly eligible face high rates of chronic illnesses, chronic conditions, um, including um, diabetes, heart, uh, uh, heart disease, hypertension. Um, about 60% of duly eligible people have multi face, uh, ex uh, experience multiple chronic conditions, and more than 40% have one or more mental health diagnoses. And across all ages, what we've seen is that the proportion of dually eligible women um, among those with multiple chronic conditions was higher than that of men. Next slide, please. What we, um, just in terms of the general population, what we know is that um, disability and age, there's a strong correlation. So the older you are, the more likely you are to have a disability. Um, when it comes to duly eligible uh, individuals who have a disability, so 64% have reported not being able to access the needed care. And this includes preventive uh, uh, health services. So 64% of those who are not being able to access care are women. And duly eligible women, so on one hand, they have, uh, they're more likely to have problems in accessing care, including preventive care, and on the other part, side of it, duly eligible women who have a disability are more likely to uh, be hospitalized and, and have um, a greater number of um, days, inpatient days, 
uh, compared to non dual eligible, compared to their peers who are non dual eligible. Um, among the general population of disabled women, what we've seen the screening rates for breast and cervical cancer among women with disabilities are consistently lower, um, uh, below, uh, consistently below national standards. And there is some variation depending on the type of disability. So for example, um, in a, a study that was conducted a few years ago, what, the, what we found was that women with physical disabilities who develop breast and cervical cancers die from them at an earlier age compared to non-disabled women. Next slide, please. So what are the barriers to preventive screening? And I, I know that um, my, the speakers after me are going to discuss this in greater detail, but people with disabilities face significant barriers to accessing care and to accessing preventive care. Um, there are they, there there have been reports, and, and this is um, throughout the research that we've conducted. There's great difficulty in getting an appointment, and there are long wait times. Um, Transportation issues, the lack of transportation, the lack of accessible transportation, the lack of accessible public transportation is a significant barrier for people with disabilities, whether accessing preventive care, accessing job opportunities, for social participation, literally every facet of their lives. So um, in, in addition to transportation, what we've also seen is that even when they actually get to their, uh, uh, to the, to their providers, there is a lack of accessible equipment and there are lack of accessible facilities. So even today, which is what, 31 years after the Americans with Disabilities Act, people with disabilities and women with disabilities are uh, facing uh, inaccessible uh, healthcare environments every day. Women with disabilities, for example, often face challenges getting into the required position or onto an accessible exam table. In my research, what we've seen consistently is women with disabilities are, are, have reported just not being, not being weighed, not being, and we've even spoken to women with congenital disabilities who have never in their lives been in, uh, uh, and don't even know of an accessible weighing scale. Um, there are also additional barriers, for example, communication barriers. There, there are, there's a limited uh, availability of appropriate and accessible communication tools. There's a lack of American Sign Language interpreters, and 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 often, um, you know, beyond these these barriers, what we've seen is um, women speak about um, the attitude of the providers and the support staff that they encounter. Um, Sometimes the attitudes is related to just the lack of provider experience in, in providing uh, care to women with disabilities, uh, particularly when it comes to actually even having the knowledge. So um, this was a study we conducted in Massachusetts a few years ago. What we found is that um, rat techs, for example, often didn't have the appropriate experience and knowledge in positioning women with physical disabilities. Next slide, please. Um, and all of this, of course, is related to the lack of adequate uh, provider and staff training. And the, a lack of ad adequate training, both in terms of interacting with people with disabilities, but also to understand the diverse needs of women with disabilities. So in a, in a recent study by Lisa Izzoni and her colleagues, what they found was among the physicians that they surveyed, 41% reported feeling very confident about their ability to provide the same quality of care to individuals with disabilities compared to those without disabilities. And as I mentioned before, what we found is that women with disabilities often report that healthcare providers interact with them in a pejorative, in a condescending, and often in a, in a patronizing manner. Next slide, please. So this was, um, you know, in this slide, what we're seeing is, is that women with different disabilities um, uh, uh, are less likely to receive mammograms, uh, the recommended ma mammograms compared to non-disabled women. So what we've seen is 73% uh, of women without disabilities report uh, between the ages of 50 and 74 report uh, receiving a mammogram in the past year 
compared to um, 67% of women uh, with any disability. And when it comes to women with cognitive disabilities, they're the least likely to receive a mammogram. Next slide, please. And again, we see uh, uh, disp uh, similar disparities in terms of the receipt of our pap test. Um, for cervical cancer screening. And, and often what we've, uh, in, in, in research that was conducted by Dr. Parrish, is what we've seen a lot of providers just assume that women with disabilities are non-sexual. And so there is a less of a likelihood of uh, pap, uh, pap test. Next slide, please. Um, in the research that I've conducted, what we've seen is that women with and without disabilities, while they report um, similar pregnancy intentions and their desire for children, but they often receive disparate treatment compared to non-disabled uh, women when seeking contraceptive care. They're also less likely to uh, uh, use uh, um, uh, uh, moderately uh, effective measures of uh, contraception, but they are more likely to be sterilized and at uh, sterilized and also sterilized at younger ages. Next slide, please. Um, it, and so on one hand, what we're seeing is that women with disabilities, um, there are biggest disparities in terms of their preconception care. But when they get pregnant and when they are uh, uh, seeking prenatal and perinatal care, what we're seeing is that women um, with disabilities are much uh, are more vulnerable to multiple risk factors. They're also more vulnerable to uh, uh, pregnancy complications. They face uh, 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 they uh, 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 there are higher rates of adverse birth outcomes, including preterm birth, including um, babies who are uh, 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 um, smaller babies. So uh, uh, preterm birth as well as infants that are uh, small for gestational age. Um, and they are um, more likely to experience pejorative attitudes from their healthcare practitioners, both at preconception care and throughout their prenatal care. Next slide, please. So I just want to summarize uh, my presentation by just saying, this, again, reiterating uh, what I um, stated earlier on, is that there is a, a really a need for data and a need, of, need for greater understanding about the needs and the experiences of uh, dually eligible women in terms of their uh, seeking preventive care. Uh, we know that people with disabilities and women with disabilities, particularly women who are dually eligible, um, they um, are more likely to have higher levels of poverty, um, uh, poor mental health, worse overall health, uh, elevated levels of stress and trauma, and uh, uh, poor experiences with their healthcare pr practitioners. So what we really need to do is also understand how these factors and their social determinants of health impact their access to preventive care. And, and I, I do want to end by um, pointing out that what we know very little about is the intersection between disability and other marginalized identities. Um, this includes women, for example, who are, are racial and ethnic minority women with disabilities, and we understand what are their experiences, what are their outcomes, and what are their you know, what are the access barriers that they face when it comes to access and preventive care? And now I'm going to turn the, uh, the talk over to Dr. John Harris. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is John Harris, and I am the director of the UPMC McGee Women's Hospital Center for Women with Disabilities. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about that clinic, about what we um, offer, and about the experiences that will be generalizable to uh, many different populations and settings. Next slide, please. Uh, you know, first I want to tell you about our, our center. It's been in, um, in existence for the last 20 years, and we're very proud of, of, that, um, of that history of access for our patients. It was started by Dr. Sandra Wellner, who was a physician who developed a mobility disability as an adult and saw, um, I guess, from, from both sides, both the challenges of providing medical care as well as the, um, the challenges that the healthcare system had in um, and in, in, in being able to receive the health care because she needed to receive it herself. Um, and she was um, instrumental in starting our clinic here in Pittsburgh um, 20 years ago. Um, it, sadly, she died uh, right after it was opened in, um, in a house fire, which is a, a known occupational hazard for people with mobility disabilities. 
Um, it's been carried on by other providers, um, including Dr. Corey, who I took over for. And uh, currently, we're, um, the team is, is made up of myself, um, Julie McKechnie, who's a nurse midwife, so we have um, both uh, you know, uh, physicians as well as um, uh, allied practice providers, um, as well as Dr. Peter Bulova, who's an internal medicine physician who comes and sees our patients uh, cooperatively. And then we have a, a experienced and um, enthusiastic, enthusiastic uh, nurse coordinator that really provides um, some care management for these patients because they do have um, complicated um, situations frequently that, that need a lot of communication. Next slide, please. So just to tell you a little bit about our clinic, these sort of clinics that specialize in these services are unusual, and um, ours is one of the larger ones, but it won't, it won't seem large um, you know, under the, the descriptions of uh, kind of normal general OBGYN clinics. So we see about 400 or more women each year. Um, we see mostly women with, um, in, with cognitive or mobility disabilities. We see um, a few people with uh, sensory disabilities, but we are, most of our focus is on intellectual and physical disabilities. And about 61% of the women that we serve are duly eligible. Um, that makes sense both in terms of the, the high uh, rate of, of disability as well as that uh, you know, many of our patients um, are, are independent or may no longer have um, other family members uh, that are able to provide care. Uh, the services that we generally offer are going to be preventive, well woman care. Um, we also provide problem visits for acute and chronic conditions related to reproductive health and GYN care, and we provide medical and surgical consultations related to um, OBGYN needs. Next slide, please. So I want to start with thinking about how to improve accessibility um, for for patients that are going to any clinic, this does not need to be a specialized clinic, but um, it really should be true of all clinics that they're receiving women's health care services. Uh, first, the location itself needs to be accessible. So what does that mean? Uh, there need to be handicapped parking spaces um, that are available um, and you know, reasonable to um, access. Sometimes um, these spaces uh, are in positions that are actually surprisingly inaccessible. Um, and so it's one of those things where if we can think about that as um, as a healthcare system or as healthcare providers, that that's um, vital to think about how to optimize those. We want to make sure that there are um, wheelchair accessible van drop-offs. Many of our patients do use um, public, publicly accessible, accessible accessibility van services, and so uh, the drop-off there is important. Um, you know, one of the things that we are um, sensitive to for our duly eligible population is the cost of receiving care. So that would be the last thing that we want to be of concern, so we um, provide, uh, so we're here in a, in a city setting where that parking would be relatively expensive even inside the, the, um, the hospital building where I'm at, and so we provide a voucher so that we can make these, uh, the parking completely free for our patients, um, which is one of the few, uh, one of the few clinics that, uh, that offers that. Um, you know, in large buildings and hospitals, uh, you know, frequently people come with caregivers, they may not be familiar with um, the hospital and um, mobility and getting places can be more complex. And so making sure that people don't get um, lost or turned in the wrong direction is important. So our front desk knows exactly where our clinic is and they, um, and they all try to help our patients whenever they uh, realize uh, where they're going. Next, you want to think about the clinic itself. And so we've established that it needs to be accessible to get to that clinic. But when people get to the clinic, what does it mean to provide um, the best possible accessibility? So uh, first is that um, routinely the, the front desk, the waiting area, may not have a desk that's low enough so that people um, who use wheelchairs for mobility are, are able to see the front desk staff um, face to face. And uh, so it's important to, to uh, provide that kind of accessibility when I'm going to make sure there's waiting space that's uh, accessible for people with wheelchairs and not just filled with, um, with existing chairs. And uh, we have the ability to have a rather large waiting area um, that provides space for people with intellectual disability that may, it may do um, a little bit better if they have a little bit more space um, to be allowed to move around and, um, and then the caregivers can feel a little less uh, self-conscious if people are a little bit more um, vocal or, or um, a little bit, you have just different behaviors than other people. Next slide, please. Uh, all right, so we've now moved into the clinic room. So this is one of the most frequently um, concerning areas for people with um, 
you know, physical and intellectual disabilities because we simply don't have a lot of clinics do not have the services necessary. So uh, first is that, is there a wheelchair accessible scale? This is a service that we offer that, um, as Dr. Mitra mentioned, is, um, is something that's very unusual, um, but to have a, a scale that uh, you can weigh a wheelchair with a person on, in it and with a, without so that you can get that person's weight is incredibly helpful. It's helpful for anyone at any time, and it's very important for people with mobility disabilities because um, changes in weight can change center of gravity, they can change accessibility, they can change independence, and we want to do our best to improve uh, and maintain independence as much as possible. Uh, is there space in the room for a wheelchair or stretcher um, and be able to transfer to an exam table? Is the exam table uh, lower, um, low enough that a transfer is possible from a wheelchair? Uh, for people that need more um, lifting assistance, uh, you know, we, we also want to make sure that our staff is safe. And so the ability to have a Hoyer lift, which would lift a patient out who is a, a, um, a full assist lift, someone that would take two or more people to move, um, helps. Uh, prevent uh, workplace injuries and keeps our patients safe. And you want to make sure people are trained to use those Hoyer lifts when they're necessary. Uh, for GYN exams, they can be challenging for people that um, that do not have uh, independent control of their lower extremities. And so, using um, what we would consider surgical style leg rests that offer full support is something that we are able to offer within our specialized clinic and would be unusual in other settings. But it's really vital to be able to provide personalized. Position. And are there tools available to help make our um, patients with intellectual disability um, and autism feel comfortable? So those are things like weighted blankets, sensory and activity toys, um, communication assistive devices are all going to be of, um, of, of importance. And then finally, making sure that the room and the bathroom is large enough to allow for both accessibility um, and to be able to do these. Next slide, please. So then we want to think about, about um, the people that are providing this care. So we want our staff to be prepared and trained. This is an important area, and this is something that every clinic, regardless of whether they have all the um, equipment, can do um, a great job in. So first, it's important before these patients come, if, if at all possible, to know what are the transfer requirements and equipment needed. This is a way that um, for places that do not have this constantly accessible, that you can help gather this equipment and make it possible. Uh, we want to make sure that scheduling and other appointments are, are efficiently scheduled so our patients often have mammograms um, before or after their visits so that they only come to um, for their women's health visits once a year and it's efficient. Are, are we staffed adequately for this care? You know, one of the, um, the challenges of providing this care is that we do have different staffing requirements than normal uh, women's health clinics and so we routinely have two staff members in a single room for an exam, which helps us be able to transfer and take great care of people, and that's something that's been set up in this clinic that is not true everywhere, but is definitely necessary at times. Uh, it's great to have staff that are comfortable with people with intellectual disability and autism spectrum disorder uh, so that they can make people feel comfortable and make sure that people have adequate training, especially with things like the Hoyer lift. Um, and I think it's important that our staff understand the, um, the history and the science behind what is known about the disparities for people with disabilities so we can do our best to provide uh, good care that avoids stigma and bias. And so we definitely do um, orientation and uh, frequent staff education to kind of stay up to date with the, the most recent research. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of communication uh, with, with patients, and this would be true um, at any level, including uh, for care managers and things like that, that it's important to get to know the specific needs and past experiences of each person. So people are not a, a single diagnosis, but everyone has a, a different experience, and it's important to ask basic questions, I think humbly ask open-ended questions that you don't assume to know what each person's needs and experiences are. Um, so making sure that you're ready for those things involves just asking um, those questions and allowing plenty of time for that discussion to take place and for the, the right amount of communication to, to, to go ahead. Next slide, please. All right, so now I'm going to talk uh, for a few minutes about specific health considerations for different um, common uh, conditions that may cause a disability um, and how to best care for them in the setting of women's health. I'm going to start with spinal cord injuries. Um, 
Spinal cord injuries are an area where I would say that the, the basic understanding of the, comp, the complications of spinal cord injuries may be um, poorly understood by a, a general women's health provider audience. And so uh, training for these, these patients is, is important to do the best we can. So there's a condition called autonomic dysreflexia, which is vital to understand for pelvic exams and evaluation of reproductive health care. Autonomic dysreflexia is um, a condition that happens after a spinal cord injury where there's a potential for a medical emergency whenever there's a neurologic stimulus below the level of the injury. So that um, stimulus may be something like a pelvic exam. It can also be something like a full bladder or a, um, a pressure injury, a variety of different things that could cause, that would cause um, pain at that level for other people, causes a dysregulated um, neurologic response that leads to high blood pressure, a low heart rate, um, and at worst can cause stroke, um, seizure, or cardiac arrest. Uh, pelvic exams can trigger this, and so it's important to, um, to ask patients whether they've experienced it in the past. Once again, patients are experts in their own body and will frequently be able to help um, educate st staff and providers um, if they ask, and I think if they have the, the providers have the right attitude towards um, you know, realizing that uh, the patients are just an expert in their own. The treatment would include for calling for help, often calling, uh, sending someone to the emergency room, removal of that stimulus, whatever has maybe caused it, placing the person in a sitting position and removing tight-fitting garments and monitoring blood pressure and heart rate. Next slide, please. Consider uh, things to think about for women with cerebral palsy is just to remind um, our audience that that's a group of conditions that involves a permanent non-progressive muscular spasms and spasticity. Cerebral palsy is, um, may be associated with intellectual disability, but is not synonymous with it, and um, is frequently it's confusing to people, and sometimes people will use the term cerebral palsy um, as a, as a um, synonym for intellectual disability, and that it would be um, unfortunate and incorrect, because uh, there are many people with cerebral palsy that do not have an intellectual disability. However, they um, will frequently need personalized positioning for physical exams due to the limited body movements, due to spasticity. Um, and the lower extremities, and this makes public exams very challenging. So um, we do our best to provide that uh, personalized uh, positioning for those patients. And uh, finally, in the case of all these conditions, there is limited evidence-based guidelines for um, common GYN concerns, including uh, contraception and managing periods, um, which can be very important in this population. And in general, people that um, are non-ambulatory, we recommend rem generally avoiding estrogen-containing medications due to the risk of uh, uh, embolism and DVT. Next slide, please. Uh, now, considering uh, thinking about health considerations for women with Down syndrome, uh, you know, a very large population of, um, of women that uh, should receive great health care, um, it's good to understand the basic physiology for different conditions. So women with Down syndrome will have normal periods, a normal start to their periods, but should tend to go into menopause at a much earlier age. Um, because of that, they have risks for bone density issues um, as they age. And it's important to, um, have, to have adequate uh, education to provide autonomy and um, you know, personal knowledge of people's um, bodies. And so we do sexual education and appropriately um, autonomy explanation um, for patients so that um, they have the, the proper understanding for their cognitive level. We provide routine screening for sexually transmitted infections, um, whether the patient or family reports any sexual activity, um, because unfortunately sexual abuse is more common in, in women with, with disabilities. And there's an increased risk of infertility, but unlike men where infertility is essentially universal, um, there is a possibility of pregnancy, and so offering contraception is important for women that um, may be sexually active. Next. Uh, next considerations for women with autism spectrum disorder and intellectual disability, two um, separate conditions, but may have some of the, some similar issues in terms of um, making people feel comfortable within a very uncomfortable exam situation. So uh, it may be possible because people do not understand the nature and the, the reasoning behind these exams that people are uh, more likely to, um, to be very guarded about these exams and very cautious. And so we do our best to make people feel comfortable, give people time to get to know us, and ideally have the cons consistent providers so that people know who we are and that we're not um, strangers to them. A common medical issues in this population may be seizure disorders or the presence of mood changes around periods. 
Um, and both of those things we can help um, manage and understand the interaction between, say, seizure disorders and, um, and periods and things like that. Unfortunately, there's a high risk of sexual assault and abuse in this population, so once again, screening for that and screening for infections is important. Uh, understanding the metapausal transition and how that can change behaviors and how people feel, uh, especially if they can't report it themselves, but maybe caregivers that notice the differences is important. And managing uh, periods and contraception that are safe and offer few interactions with medications and other um, conditions is, is vital. Next slide, please. So now just to talk about general person-centered skills for um, providing care and for interacting with patients um, in the, the women's health sphere. Um, first, when completing a complete OBGYN history, it's important to cover many of the same uh, areas that we would cover with anyone. So we cover the reproductive history and plans, um, sexual activity and dysfunction, expectations and concerns about pregnancy, um, past pelvic exam history and experience, and the effects of pelvic discomfort on spasticity, history of autonomic dysreflexia among women with injury. Next slide, please. When performing an exam, uh, clinicians should um, offer assistance when necessary for transferring to an exam table. Certainly many people are independent, but we want to make sure that people feel safe um, and both on transfer and then uh, sitting on the exam table. Uh, we do not perform um, exams in the wheelchair. That is certainly um, seen as an expedient for in certain um, options, but in general we try to provide people the exact same care and the same access to, um, to the right exams as everyone else. So we, we go through the extra process of transferring people um, uh, even when a, a relatively minor exam is necessary, like an abdominal exam. And then, as I said before, the use of specialized leg supports is really vital for people that may need assistance um, with uh, supporting their legs during a gynecologic exam. Uh, Additionally, when performing an exam, you want to notice um, when positioning to watch out for causing balance issues, um, causing issues with spasticity, um, causing issues with skin pressure, especially over um, the back of the hips where um, people can have pressure injuries and pressure ulcers, um, the, the presence of contractures um, that may make it so that the classic uh, pelvic exam position um, is difficult to um, kind of get to, and so we can use alternative positions um, that, that's more comfortable for people. To manage anxiety, uh, which would be present for many people when receiving women's health care, but um, especially for people that may not understand this well in the presence of an intellectual disability, um, we want to explain the, the process of that at an appropriate level and seek to gain trust. And so I always um, encourage other providers to, to really be especially humble in this population to um, talk to people about what they understand and what they don't understand about the patient's condition, um, to take extra time to explain themselves, to encourage patients to give a lot of feedback um, so that they can maintain a sense of control throughout the visit. Always, uh, this could be a traumatizing uh, visit for anyone and um, be more so for people that have either less autonomy or may have less um, ability to, uh, to control say, all their appendages um, on their own. Anxiety medications may be helpful in certain circumstances for people with intellectual disability, though I would tell you that, um, that the, 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 the quality of the team is much more important um, to make people comfortable than, than medications. Next slide, please. Um, and then when a pelvic exam is indicated, it's important to communicate um, actions clearly, to conduct an especially gentle exam, to make people as comfortable as possible, including using medications like topical lidocaine, um, for people with a spinal cord injury, emptying the bladder can be helpful, finding a position that's comfortable and using uh, the proper instrument um, and having access to many different size instruments um, for pelvic exams is important. Next slide. Um, so I'm going to pass it off to Amy Shannon, a consumer of, um, of healthcare and, and uh, an amazing person. So I, I thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Harris. My name is Amy Shannon. I'm 44 years old. I live in southwestern Pennsylvania, and in 1989, I had a diving accident that resulted in a spinal cord injury and quadriplegia. As Dr. Harris said, spinal cord injuries can be very complicated because the body does not function normally. For example, I don't have any sensation 
from my armpit down, but that does not mean that the nerves are dead. It just means that there's a blockage from the nerves from my feet being able to send a message to my brain to let me know that there's some kind of discomfort or pain. So I've had a problem because I've had surgery and the surgeons have said, you don't need general anesthesia because you don't have any feeling, so let's just put you in sedation. And the first time this happened, I went with the doctor. Um, I was young, and I thought the doctor knew best, and so I was sedated for a hemorrhoidectomy. And then partway through the surgery, my body went into autonomic dysreflexia. I was spasming severely. My blood pressure went up. And the doctor seemed like he panicked a little bit because they brought me out of the sedation and told me what was happening and asked if they could keep me overnight for a procedure that was supposed to be outpatient, which I agreed because I was, like, half sedated and didn't really know what was going on. But afterwards, I realized that it was autonomic dysreflexia. And so ever since then, I usually try to talk to an anesthesiologist and make sure that they understand that I don't have any feelings, but I still need general anesthesia because we don't want to have autonomic dysreflexia or some reaction like that during surgery. Another thing that happened to me was that I was supposed to go to see my physiatrist, and they must have called to change the appointment because they wanted me to get a pelvic exam, and it, the gynecologist wasn't available at the time that my appointment was scheduled, but I never got the message about the time change. So when I showed up, they weren't expecting me, and they said, oh, you were supposed to come this other day to get a pelvic exam. And I was like, what? I didn't know anything about that. And it was very traumatic because I felt like I didn't have a choice over having something done to my body. They had said that they preferred to do this because um, I think it was probably in the early 90s and there wasn't a lot of options for women with spinal cord injuries to find accessible uh, gynecologists. So they just figured that they would schedule and take care of that for me. But instead of and them taking care of it for me, I waited until this year at 44 years of age to finally go to the Center for Women with Disabilities and have any kind of um, gynecological screening. And uh, another big issue I find is that I would prefer to have my own attendant or whoever is with me in the room to assist me with maybe getting dressed or undressed, maybe even assist with the um, the transfer because they're familiar with me, they know how my body works and it's more comfortable, especially if I'm somewhere that I've never met the people and I don't know what kind of training they have. A lot of people, a lot of staff doesn't have the proper training. Um, especially with transfers. So most of my experience going to the doctor, they never actually transfer me out of my wheel, wheelchair into the bed to do kind of any kind of exam. But a lot of times when they do, they want to just go under my arms and under my knees to lift, which doesn't support the heaviest part of my body. So my butt is hanging down, and that's very unsafe because it, it could cause... Um, my shoulder to be dislocated. Um, transportation issues are something that are always a barrier to going anywhere for someone with a disability. And I've been very lucky to be able to have a personal wheelchair accessible van so that I can get to wherever I need to go. And then the problem when I get there is sometimes is there's not enough parking because there's always a shortage of handicapped parking. Um, it's not always safe to park somewhere 
and then walked through the parking lot because um, if someone's wheelchair is very low, they might not be seen by a driver in the rear view mirror and they could be hit. I don't have that problem because I use a power chair, but um, manual chairs, that could be a bigger problem. Um, and then shared ride services, um, it's called access here, but a lot of people with wheelchairs need to take shared ride services to get places. And the shared ride services are, uh, the main focus is to get as many people rides as often and as possible and have as many people get to their de destination in one day as possible. So they pick you up and then they go pick up other people and they might drop some other people off before. So they're not really looking at time and how much time it, that it takes or uh, a lot of times when I've used it, I would be somewhere like an hour early and you're just sitting around waiting um, with nothing to do. So um, that's very frustrating because even if the provider will take you earlier, then you're probably going to be waiting for like an hour afterwards until the van comes back and is scheduled to pick you up. Um, accessibility is difficult. Uh, like I said, when I've gone to doctor's appointments before, um, they don't transfer me out of the out of my wheelchair, but a lot of times when I'm in the office in the exam room, it's not even big enough for me to figure out where I can go in and turn around. And a lot of times, um, chairs need to be moved, or I'm kind of like stuck halfway between the door and the exam table. Um, it's, I just never feel like rooms are big enough. And it makes it difficult to transfer if I can't get close enough to the exam table. Um, also, when you're looking at locations, parking spaces need to be flat. It's a lot easier to get in and out of the building that's flat and not like on a big slope or um, kind of a steep hill. Uh, and so my experience at McGee was very different because it is a big hospital with a lot of parking. All the par although the parking was all full, so my mom and I did go and park somewhere else, and then I had to walk through the parking lot to get to the building. Um, and then when my mom and I were leaving, she just figured she would go get the van and come pick me up because that would be easier. Um, there were doors that were easily open so that I could get in and out of the building. The elevator was accessible. And mostly, um, going to the Center for Women with Disabilities uh, was the staff being so welcoming. Um, the room was bigger. I saw a horror look in the room right away. The bed raised and lowered. And I just knew that I was in the right place to get the right kind of care. But not all people with disabilities are good at advocating for themselves or even know how to advocate for themselves because a lot of times we're not even talked to as people. I went to a doctor recently and my mom was with me and um, I saw a CRNT and she actually spoke to my mom about me in a third person for the majority of the appointment instead of talking to me. And I was the one who called and made the appointment. You know, I just needed my mom to drive me there, open the door, and then I wasn't sure if they were going to need to take an EKG, so I wanted her to be there just in case. But, um, you know, that was really difficult, and I didn't know what to say. And I asked a friend later, like, how do I advocate for myself in the future because it was so uncomfortable. And I should have said something from the very beginning, but I hadn't gone to this CRMP before, and I was used to the other CRMPs that I'd been to, you know, talking directly to me, and this was kind of a surprise and caught me off guard. So I would say listening and asking questions and talking to the person who has the appointment directly is, are very important. 
and then I will pass it along to Sarah. All right. Thanks so much, Amy. Um, I, I want to start first by just thanking Gretchen, Toby, the Medicare Medicaid Coordination Office, and Porvi, Jennifer, the whole RIC and Lewin team for inviting me to participate um, on a panel and speak on a topic that is very near and dear to me, both professionally and personally, as a woman with a disability myself. Um, in addition to a mental health disability, I was born with a hereditary and incurable immune system disorder and had an immunologist tell me when I was 16 that I should take birth control so I wouldn't, quote, contaminate the gene pool. So although I'm not duly eligible and have tremendous privilege as a cisgender woman with a hidden disability, access to preventive care, health care for women with disabilities is something I definitely identify with and have lots of very strong opinions on. Um, today I want to tell you just a little bit about the work we've been doing at Centene in this space and then end by sharing some specific challenges and next steps for Centene, but also for CMS, states, advocates, and other health plans that I believe could significantly increase access to preventive health care for women with disabilities. Next slide, please. Centene is the nation's largest Medicaid managed care and long-term services and supports organization, serving over one million duly eligible individuals across 35 states. Next slide, please. But before I tell you about one of our specific programs, the Provider Accessibility Initiative, I'd like to share just a quick story. Um, in a prior life, I was the executive director of a Center for Independent Living in California, and my board chair was a fantastic advocate named Cynthia Waddell. In 2012, Cynthia was diagnosed with a brain tumor, and she asked me to go with her to her first MRI, and I'll never forget the look on the MRI tech faces when we walked in and they realized, oh, she's deaf. And they had absolutely no clue how to do an MRI on someone who is deaf. I mean, think about it. You're in there. There's that really loud noise. They're saying to you, hold your breath. Now breathe. You know, how do you do that with somebody who's deaf? And unfortunately, by the time they finally figured it out months later, Cynthia's brain tumor was inoperable and she had passed away. But I mean, I'm not telling you anything you probably don't already know, either through personal experience like Amy's or through a friend or family member who uses a wheelchair and can't remember the last time they were weighed at a doctor's office or who needed materials in accessible formats at a doctor's office and never got them or went for years without dental care because the dental offices had no idea how to effectively serve someone with an intellectual or developmental disability. So as a woman with a disability myself, I'm very, very proud to work for a company that finds that situation unacceptable and decided in 2017 to take a leadership role in addressing it, not because there's some requirement that says we have to, but because it's the right thing to do, plain and simple, but also because Centene, we have a National Disability Advisory Council and duly eligible beneficiaries across the country in our member advisory committees told us that we should. should. So in partnership with the National Council on Independent Living, NICL, and NICL's Rockstar Network of Centers for Independent Living, for the last three and a half years, we've been actively working to increase the percentage of our providers across the nation that meet minimum federal and state disability access standards so that our members with disabilities and their companions with disabilities, say a parent of a child um, who has a disability, have equal access to quality health care and services that are physically and programmatically accessible. So how are we doing that? First and foremost, we set an expectation in 2017 that if you want to do business with Centene, you better be or quickly become accessible to people with disabilities. So we, re we routinely ask all 1,091,000 of our providers with brick and mortar locations across the country to ask a standard set of questions about their disability access that are the same in every state. But we don't just take their word for it that they're accessible, right? Because a lot of them don't even know what accessibility really means. So local Center for Independent Living staff have trained our health plan staff on how to conduct on-site accessibility site reviews of the provider's offices to verify their level of accessibility. But, you know, it's not enough to just verify that a doctor's office is inaccessible and then put that in our provider directory. That doesn't help our member who needs an accessible mammogram. You know, one of the reasons that most providers give for not making their offices accessible to people with disabilities is cost. 
And when I was a SIL director, I used to think that was just kind of a poor excuse. But after working in a Medicaid managed care company for many years now, I've seen firsthand that for many smaller mom and pop Medicaid providers, it's a very real barrier. Some of them are struggling financially just to keep their doors open. And as the largest Medicaid and one of the largest dual-serving health plans in the country, you know, we believe we have a responsibility and an obligation to help those providers remove that financial barrier to disability compliance so that our members with disabilities have equal access to the same health care and services as everyone else. So in 2017, we created a national barrier removal fund that providers can apply to for money to remove disability access barriers at their office, whether they be physical barriers or programmatic. To date, over $1.3 million have gone out to 152 provider offices in nine states to remove disability access barriers, along with countless hours of technical assistance from NICL, the local cells, and our health plans. Next slide, please. And among those grants have been several specifically targeted to women with disabilities. So we helped install a digital enunciator that announces the floors in the elevator at the Institute for Women's Health in Texas. We did a complete women's restroom remodel at an internal medicine office in Florida. And we provided 91 accessible OBGYN tables in all nine states where we've implemented this initiative so far. Next slide, please. And I'll never forget, you know, one of the first calls I got after we launched the initiative from a nurse at a women's clinic when her office received the accessible exam table. She was so happy because up till that point, they had been doing what Dr. Harris mentioned, giving pelvic exams and pap smears to women in wheelchairs while they were sitting in their wheelchairs. Yeah, ouch. I mean, think, I think that might have some impact on how many women actually schedule an appointment for a pelvic or pap smear. Yeah, next slide, please. So one of the grants was also made to a residential addiction treatment facility in Illinois that was temporarily housing the women and men in the same wing of the building because the women's ward was not accessible and the state had to shut it down. We added a ramp and the women's ward was successfully reopened. And we were thrilled when a mental health office in Indiana asked for funding to install a fully accessible diaper changing station in their women's bathroom. So we know intuitively that these grants we're providing are improving the health outcomes of duly eligible women with disabilities, but unfortunately, all attempts to prove that by securing um, funding from the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research with three different university centers on disability have been unsuccessful so far. Next slide, please. So in addition to that provider accessibility, several other things our long-term services and supports and Medicare Medicaid plans across the country are doing to increase access to preventative care for duly eligible women with disabilities include um, they make extra payments to OBGYN providers for practice visits so that women with intellectual, developmental, or other types of disabilities too can visit the office before their actual appointment, meet the staff, see and touch the tools that will be used on them in their exams to really reduce their anxiety and fear. Um, we also have partnerships with local centers for independent living and DD providers to proactively distribute HPV immunization information. Um, to women with physical and developmental disabilities. Um, we require that all staff go through biannual trauma-informed care training, which not entirely, but does disproportionately impact women. And every month, our quality improvement teams identify women with gaps in breast and cervical cancer screenings, and then proactively work with our care management teams to contact those women and help them address any barriers that they might have to getting those important screenings that Amy was talking about, like actually scheduling the appointment, scheduling accessible transportation, getting an ASL interpreter. You know, since the pandemic started, we've seen an increase in the number of women with disabilities that have flat out refused to schedule preventative screenings because the threat of going to a doctor's office and contracting the COVID virus is actually greater to them than the threat of getting breast or cervical cancer. So to address that, our plan in California, HealthNet, has done things like paid for home provider visits and screenings and in-home test kits. But the fear of having someone unknown even come into their home is still very real. And as my experience when I was 16 demonstrates, and as Dr. Mitra pointed out, there's a strong societal assumption that women with disabilities can't have children, and if we can, we shouldn't. But Superior Health Plan in Texas is directly confronting that stereotype by proactively offering care coordination assistance with perinatal, postpartum, 
family planning to four duly eligible women in our Medicare and Medicaid plan. Next slide, please. If I had to pick the greatest barrier for health plans today in serving duly eligible women with disabilities, I would say it's data or lack thereof. In fact, in 2017, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities released a report on the sexual and reproductive rights of women and girls with disabilities and cited the lack of data and information on women and girls with disabilities as the main barrier to implementation of gender responsive and disability inclusive strategies worldwide. So let me give you just one example of this problem. So when health plans get eligibility data from state Medicaid agencies through what's called the 834 file, it always lists certain demographic information for our members, like name, address, date of birth, age, sex, if it includes language or race. And that's a big if. Nine times out of ten, it's inaccurate. And it never includes disability because a majority of state Medicaid eligibility applications don't ask Medicaid applicants if they have a disability. So the only way health plans really know the disability status of our members is, number one, if we ask them, which we do, but that takes time, a long time, particularly if the contact information in the 834 was inaccurate, which it usually is. So if we want to identify our members with disabilities quickly, we have to get at it through waiver eligibility, rate cells, or claims. But even those methods are imperfect because you can have a member who is, say, for example, deaf who won't show up in any of those sources unless you try to piece together certain diagnostic codes. And even then, there isn't like a specific diagnosis code for deaf or blind. We have to take medically-based diagnostic codes like macular degeneration and retinitis pigmentosa and piece them together to get to the members who are blind. I mean, even with developmental disability, you can track the population in the IDD waivers, but what about people with developmental disabilities who don't receive waiver services and who have claims that are like for an ear infection or stomach flu? So on this slide, I've listed the percentage of duly eligible women in Centene's Medicare Medicaid plans with women representing the highest percentage than men in all six states. And I also have here two graphs showing the COVID mortality rate among all six of our MMPs combined, stratified by sex, setting, and age, with duly eligible women and men over 65 in nursing facilities having the highest COVID mortality rate. But if I want to get more granular than that and get a breakdown of how many of those women over 65 in nursing facilities have a physical, cognitive, developmental, or sensory disability, I can't do it, or at least not easily and without great expense. It's unbelievable. I mean, if you ask this same question in an educational or employment context, there's no problem. Tell me the number of kids that have developmental disabilities. Boom, you got it. Ask it in healthcare, forget it. Next slide, please. So what do health plans need to better meet the preventative health care needs of duly eligible women with disabilities? We need data. We need state Medicaid agencies to ask about disability on their eligibility applications using something like the American Community Survey Disability Question. And then we need them to share that with us. <laughs> Number two, and I'm going a little out of, bit out of order here, we need NIDLR to fund evaluations of efforts like the Provider Accessibility Initiative so we can prove that providing greater access to preventative health care for duly eligible women with disabilities has an impact not only on the beneficiary health, but also on larger systems, outcomes, and costs. Number three, we need more women with disabilities in the health professions. While we can certainly educate providers like mine who told me I would contaminate the gene pool, I'd much rather invest our nation's time and resources into helping women with disabilities become doctors who can then change the medical model from the inside out. And last, but certainly not least, number four, Yes, we are seeing COVID-specific racial and gender disparities in testing, hospitalization, mortality, vaccination, but all of these things are really just a microcosm of the systemic racism and sexism evident throughout our health systems, particularly for duly eligible women with disabilities. And nowhere is that more apparent than in the widespread practice that Dr. Mitra mentioned of sterilizing women of color with developmental disabilities. Now, forced sterilization of women of color in ICE facilities and prisons has been in the news lately, right? But what most, most people don't know is that women with developmental disabilities have been and continue to be sterilized by their guardians at a rate three times that of the general population, all under the guise of preventive health care to 
prevent them basically from menstruating, getting pregnant, and yes, contaminating the gene pool. Um, in their March 8th letter to President Biden calling on him to establish an Office of Sexual and Reproductive Health within the Domestic Policy Council, the National Birth Equity Collaborative stated that the gravest effect of our broken system is persistent inequity which denies people of color, people in rural communities, people with disabilities, and people of low income without autonomy to determine their reproductive futures and therefore the array of health and economic decisions key to their lives. So to end, I'm not asking for much, right? Just reproductive justice for developmentally disabled women of color, health care jobs for women with disabilities, Nidler funding, and data. That's it. I'm not very hard to please. <laughs> Centene is just scratching the surface with some of the things we're doing to improve access to preventative health care for duly eligible women with disabilities. But thank you for letting me share some of those things with you. And I look forward to hearing your ideas on how we can advance them even further together. And now I think I'll turn it back to Porvi. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah, Amy, Dr. Harris, and Dr. Mitra for your really informative and great presentations. Um, we now have time for questions from the audience. Thank you to everyone who's already submitted questions. If you have any additional questions for our speakers, please submit them using the Q&A feature on the lower left of the presentation screen. You can type your comment at the bottom of the Q&A box and press submit to send. So our first question involves COVID-19. What are some examples of unique and innovative approaches to ensure that preventive and well care occurs for this population during the public health emergency? Um, Dr. Harris, I'll turn the question to you first. Absolutely. Um, well, I will tell you that certainly the whole healthcare system, we, we started at a, you know, an extreme level of caution about COVID-19 when we had very little information. I know that in April and May, our clinic shut down just because we, we thought that, you know, the last thing we wanted to do was expose anyone. Um, a lot of our patients live in, in group residential settings. We didn't want to expose people to um, to COVID-19. But over time, um, you know, the evidence has shown that with proper um, protective equipment and precautions that uh, receiving even, uh, you know, uh, preventive health care services is safe um, in healthcare settings. And so we've tried to uh, reassure um, our own patients that providing that that we have that there's a good history here of being able to provide safe care, and that while any of these particular services may be able to be delayed for you know some weeks or months and circumstances that we don't want people to be um, to to forget about them or to uh, to to not get them at all, and so we try to encourage people to come in and receive the care that they would normally get, um, whether it's a pandemic or not. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Harris. Sarah, do you have any examples of uh, unique and innovative approaches during COVID-19? Yeah, um, I can share just a couple of them. One was, you know, health plans are required to create care plans for our members, and in those care plans we have to share what the backup, the emergency backup is in case they, if they have a personal attendant or a DSP who can't come. Um, but what we found in COVID was that a lot of those attendants couldn't couldn't go to help the member because, you know, they either had COVID themselves, they were isolating and had children, um, and then their backup in some instances, who was usually a family member, got COVID and couldn't go serve them. And specifically for people who self-direct their care, um, this was a huge issue um, because there was nobody, you know, there wasn't a plan C to the plan B. <laughs> and so we actually set up a 1-800 line that our members could call who were in this situation if they needed an emergency direct care worker. And we would dispatch somebody within 30 minutes to um, 60 minutes in rural areas. Um, so that was kind of one, I think, unique preventive measure that we, we tried to take during covid Thanks, Sarah. Dr. Mitra, I'll turn the question to you. Sure. I, um, you know, I'm going to go with um, telehealth. You know, I think telehealth has been a real boom, and particularly when you're thinking of, for example, uh, behavioral health. Um, but I also want to caution that we, you know, it is one strategy, and um, 
this made permanent, if the expansion to telehealth is made permanent, I think we have to ensure um, that it is accessible. And we also have to ensure that we take into account the social determinants of health and people's access to broadband and people's access to smartphones um, and, and ensure it's not just, you know, it's one of multiple strategies. Great. Thank you, Dr. Mitra. And Amy, do you have anything to share about your experience accessing healthcare during COVID-19? I agree uh, with Dr. Mitra about the telehealth because I was able to, to continue seeing or talking to my um, psychiatrist and getting meds. And I was able to telehealth with my physiatrist and my PCP as well so that I was able to continue getting the care that I needed, but didn't have to go into the office or anywhere that I didn't feel safe. So I hope that continues because it's been a great resource. Wonderful. Thank you. Following up on the issue of telehealth, um, Dr. Harris, how can providers effectively use telehealth to help address some of the transportation or appointment access barriers to preventive care that duly eligible women with disability face? The ideal circumstance would be that um, that the care team does establish communication and ask some detailed questions about accessibility needs and expectations before the patient comes in. I'm thankful to, to have a great team and my nurse coordinator um, essentially screens everyone that comes through to make sure that she understands their needs and that we're not going to have um, you know, a constraint with two people needing certain pieces of equipment at the same time and things like that. So, you know, being able to communicate, um, whether that's by um, by you know, telephone or by telehealth visit uh, with the care team beforehand is, is critical um, and, and really does help uh, the, the appointment start off at the, on the right step when we um, are able to be prepared. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Sarah, do you have any other um, strategies or considerations for these with telehealth? Yeah, you know, um, one of the things that we did, because states were coming out at the very beginning of the pandemic with these um, hospital triage guidelines that basically said if a person with a disability or an older adult comes in for COVID, don't treat them. <laughs> and so we established a partnership with the National Council on Independent Living, and we developed a series of tip sheets that we sent out to, uh, you know, the over a million providers that we have in, across the country. And one of those, they basically saying that's illegal, don't do that. <laughs> and here's the rights of our members with disabilities. Um, but we also developed a tip sheet specifically around how to provide accessible telehealth for people with all different kinds of disabilities, highlighting, you know, um, you know things that, that most people take for granted, like take off your mask when you're doing a telehealth appointment with somebody who is deaf. <laughs> You know, sometimes people don't think about that, um, or they might just have it on instinctively. Um, so that that was um, one of the ways um, that we helped to really promote more effective use of telehealth to address some of these barriers. Thank you. Dr. Mithra, do you have anything else to add around telehealth? I think one one you know as I, I I just want to be cautionary in terms of let's not swap one set of barriers for another. So you, you know obviously telehealth is is really important because it's it um, overcomes the transportation issues. You know, and I think Amy, for example, outlined and we've done a lot of work and looking at. And barriers, uh, for example, to mammography, and one barrier is transportation, but also, as Amy mentioned, accessible parking spots. Often they're not designated, and often they're not, um, you know, there are other people parking on it, not available. So, yes, telehealth is, is great, but let's, again, be cautionary and make sure that it's, uh, um, it's one tool in the toolbox and that they are ensuring that it's accessible and that... Uh, um, and, and that we take into account people's access to technology. Great. Thank you, Dr. Nita. In your earlier presentations, you mentioned um, some of the increased challenges and barriers that um, women from 
racial and ethnic minority space um, in accessing preventive health care. So do you have any uh, examples of best practices and needed changes to address these inequities? Um, Dr. Mitra, I can start with you. Sure. So um, I think I'm going to second um, what Sarah mentioned related to data. So we know that women with disabilities and women with different disabilities, um, particularly you know, intellectual and developmental disabilities, face significant challenges um, in terms of their access and also disparate outcomes uh, in terms of their access to sexual reproductive health care, maternal health care. Um, and we also know that there are really profound disparities for women of color, particularly black women in the United States, and these disparities are growing. Um, very little is known really about the intersection, you know, and very, very little is known about, um, uh, about how women with, who are uh, black and brown women with disabilities, uh, about their interactions with the healthcare system, their, uh, about their outcomes, and, and this is really, really important because, you know, what we want to know is that are uh, these disparities, are they compounded? So whether having, uh, being both black or, and brown, or brown and having a disability, um, are there, uh, does it compound the disparities as opposed to being a member of, of, of either of one of those marginalized groups? Uh, and so we really need to um, examine this intersection. We really need to understand it and develop a strategy so that we can eliminate these disparities. Great. Thank you, Dr. Mitra. Dr. Harris, same question for you. Uh, it is a very challenging uh, circumstance to address uh, multiple um, areas where there are disparities present, and when the disparities intersect, you know, one of the challenges is simply having, um, you know, enough information about their, the particular circumstances there to to be able to correctly address them. So, I I try to approach my understanding of of the disparities around uh, race in the U.S. with the same way that I approach the disparities around uh, disability care as one you know worth humility and where. I try to address my questions and concerns uh, clearly and to patients. And so I have, um, you know, one of the important resources for uh, women with disability around um, pregnancy and parenting as um, social networks. And, you know, I do have some concerns that, you know, if the social networks don't um, properly um, represent uh, minority populations, that that would be a, a barrier to making these uh, groups of women that have um, stories and experiences around, you know, walking through pregnancy and parenting with a disability um, as being challenging. And so I try to talk with my patients personally. I know I, I definitely want to have my patients be able to give feedback about how we can do better. And, um, you know, we are trying to also address these issues by talking about disability care with um, community organizations that focus on the uh, the need for a better care for, um, and and you know, in, in my what I'm thinking about is a particular community organization that cares um, for Black women in pregnancy and parenting, and so trying to reach out and try to offer a little bit of experience about pregnancy and also learning how we can um, better provide care by listening. So it's a uh, it's a real challenge, and it it, it definitely takes a lot of humility as a provider. Great. Thank you, Dr. Harris. And Sarah, same question for you. Yeah, um, I think, you know, first and foremost, but at least the way approach we take at Centene is um, nothing about us without us. So we actually have a Executive Diversity and Health Disparity Council that is made up of experts um, from different, um, you know, communities of color who um, advise us on, they look at the data that we do have and advise us on, um, you know, methods that we should take. Um, I will highlight, you know, there are a couple of specific things. We were um, doing some work around access to doulas uh, for women of color in particular. Um, and then also there's, there's groups like um, a nonprofit organization out of California called REACH, um, that are doing some really great work around maternal health remote monitoring, um, and they get like blood pressure monitors out to particularly African American women 
um, who are who are pregnant um, to really monitor their health during COVID when you know they're not wanting to go into a doctor's office. Can't blame them. Um, and so there, are, I would highlight that as as a best practice that I've seen in in this space. Okay, thank you so much, Sarah. Our next question is around communication. Are there examples of communication strategies or messaging that have been particularly successful with women uh, with disabilities? Amy, I'll direct that question to you first. Have you had any, um, do you have any examples to share of effective communication strategies? I've been thinking about this a lot, and I don't have any examples, but I do think that this is very important because um, through thinking about it, I realized that um, a lot of my thinking, I have like some limiting beliefs about things. When I see a flyer, a lot of times it's all, almost like I assume, well, that doesn't apply to me. If it doesn't say something about being wheelchair accessible or inclusive or anything, then considering that so many things are inaccessible or even if they are accessible, um, you know, it's not a healthcare thing, but my friend talked about trying to vote and she had to go this really long convoluted way to get to uh, get into the building and then it was through the basement and all this stuff. And so I just assume that that's how things will always be. So unless I know that it is something that is accessible or with an organization that um, is aware of accessibility issues, then a lot of times I'm already like, well, that's not an option for me. So I, I just think that when you're um, – you know, communicating with people with disabilities, there's a lot of things that you have to combat as far as like our own thinking and expectations because of that. And um, but I'm not really sure how to tell people, you know, how to do that. Those are really important points. Thank you, Amy. Dr. Harris, do you have any examples of effective communication strategies? Um, you know, I, I think that I just to, to repeat myself, I always, when I'm educating other providers, I always want to remind them that, um, especially for people with physical disabilities, that they are an absolute expert in their care. They have seen many, many doctors and providers over many years. They can see straight through you, and you cannot pretend um, in any way with with a patient with that amount of experience and, and, and understanding of the healthcare system. So humility and asking questions and listening um, go a long way. We thankfully do have longer appointments in our center, and so that's sort of built into our ability to provide care. But, you know, frequently, and especially in women's health clinics, that our visit volume is pretty high, and it would not, you know, the, the ability to have that extra time, it can be very challenging to the whole clinic flow. So. Um, so, you know, listening to patients, understanding what they have to, to share, and then starting to apply our own, you know, priorities and, and, and the think goals that we have for the visit is really, uh, I think, vital to communicating and to having a successful um, uh, therapeutic relationship. Thank you, Dr. Harris. On that note about educating um, physicians and healthcare staff, are there other best practice, practices that you recommend um, to educate individuals who may not understand what a disability is and how to provide care to duly eligible women with disabilities? Dr. Harris, I don't know if you have anything else to add there. Um, you know, the, the resources that have been put together for this um, event are really incredible. I would say just first class in terms of the um, the resources that have been collected, and so I do want to just highlight the hard work of the team that put together those resources and just point out that there are a multitude of resources from many different places that would, would I think, apply to your particular situation. There are more provider-focused ones, more plan-focused ones. Um, uh, there's, there's a lot of things out there, um, and they are available, and in this case, uh, just well organized. So we, I'm really, really thankful for that opportunity to, to use those resources. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Dr. Mithra, do you have any best practices you recommend for educating individuals about disability and how to provide care to duly eligible women with disability? You know, I'm going to go um, to what Sarah mentioned, and um, is it's really nothing about us without us. So I think that we have to, you know, in terms of ensuring best practices, is ask people, ask women on what with disabilities or women of color with disabilities, you know, what are the, the what is the best way of providing care. And I think in, in, in also, you know, related to that in almost all the research that I've done, you know, providers, um, staff, and healthcare uh, facilities have all requested and, and suggested the need for training, the need for a better understanding so that they can do their work better. And I think that we have to figure out as a society and as, is, is how do we ensure that uh, practitioners and providers at all levels, at all uh, they are are trained and are um, and and both in terms of you know beyond clinical training, but interacting, ensuring that places are accessible. Because if we all do our own on part in this, then um, you know accessible. Then then it'll it's not it will be beyond grants. It'll be you know uh, it'll improve our attitudes towards people with disabilities. It'll ensure that we are fully accessible and inclusive. Great. Thank you, Dr. Mitra. We have time for one last question. Um, what strategies would you recommend for helping someone who is traumatized in earlier years trust the healthcare provider to perform healthcare screenings? Um, Dr. Harris, I'll turn it to you. I think for um, providers that I do not expect to perform a exam often in that first visit, um, especially with someone that has had a traumatic experience, I want them to to get to know me and to get to know our team and understand um, what their experience is and move from there. So I think that sometimes, you know, thankfully in most circumstances that's appropriate. Obviously, if it was more acute, then uh, you you need to do what's correct. But I think understanding that an introductory visit will be very appropriate and um, necessary for many visits after. Uh, an experience of someone's traumatized, and obviously we try to meet everyone's experience. We're you know, thankful to have providers of uh, different genders, uh, different uh, styles, and everything else, so that we try to try to meet people where they're at. But you need to understand where they're at, and they need to feel safe to feel like they're not going to be um, to be asked to do something they're not comfortable yet. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Dr. Mitra, is there anything you would add? Yeah, you know, this is a really important question, and I think um, that we need to um, that, that that there are a lot of people with disabilities, and a greater proportion than people without disabilities, that who have faced different um, traumatic events. Um, they're also more likely to have experienced different types of violence. So I think for providers to understand this and to then provide care. In, in, a, in an appropriate way is really, really important. Um, and I, in terms of the best, of, you know, the best way to provide the care, I'm going to go with what, what Dr. Harris mentioned. But I think this, this awareness of, um, of the potential for someone coming into the office who might, might have experienced a traumatic event is, is really, really important. Great. Thank you, Dr. Mitra. And thank you so much to all of our speakers for your presentations and uh, answering our audience questions. Thank you so much to our audience for joining us today. At this time, if you have any additional questions or comments, please email ric at lewin.com. The slides for today's presentation, a recording, and the transcript will be available on the Resources for Integrated Care website shortly, as well as the resource guide that Dr. Harris mentioned. Follow us on Twitter at at integrate underscore care to learn more about upcoming webinars and new products. If you're applying for NASW credits or CNE contact hours, please complete the post test by 11.59 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow in order to receive credit. Please complete our brief evaluation of this webinar so that we can continue to de deliver high quality presentations. The survey will appear on your screen following the conclusion of this session. 
again, thank you so much to our speakers and thank you all for attending. This concludes the webinar.